Hello, my miraculous friend, and welcome to another episode of the Magnify Your Miracles podcast. This is Reverend Francis Faden, and I'm so grateful to get to spend this time with you. And today we get to talk about one of my favorite things, books. Yay. And before we get into today's spiritual book review, let's take a few deep breaths together. Just get ourselves grounded and centered and really ready to receive whatever inspiration is here for you. And as always, if you're driving in the car while you're listening, please keep your eyes open, but you can still bring your awareness to your breath. Breathing in the energy of expansion and breathing out anything that you no longer need. And giving yourself complete permission to be right here, right now, in this moment where the divine dwells. And knowing that whatever it is that you need to hear today is exactly what you're gonna hear. Let's take one more deep breath in gratitude and we can begin. Well, hello once again, my friends, and welcome to the Magnify Your Miracles podcast. I am going to be sharing with you a book that has really touched my heart, and I'm so, so grateful that I found it and that I, and that I read it. And this book is Shri Ma, The Life of a Saint. It's a biography of a woman saint from India who's actually still alive. She's still in her body by Swami Satyananda Saraswati who is, um, to say he's her disciple, is not 100% accurate, although uh, for our purposes, it'll be accurate for today. I'll tell you a little bit more about that as I tell you a little bit about this story. So first, I want to share with you, why am I sharing this book uh, in the month of May? So we are in the month of May. This is when I'm recording this, and May is the month of miracles. It's known as Mother Mary's Month. And since I've been working with Mother Mary, she has said every year that May is the month of miracles. It is the time of year where we can feel her presence very easily. And it's also the time of year that we can really magnify the miraculous energy in our lives. And we do that by keeping our thoughts as high as possible, focusing on the things we want, letting go of focusing on things that we don't want, and keeping ourselves in that elevated state as much as possible. So I have been reading this book about Sri Ma, and Sri Ma, in my opinion, is one of the manifestations of the Divine Mother. She's an incarnation of Divine Mother. And uh, I've just recently gotten to know her energy, and it's so exciting when I find that these people who I love and admire through reading their books are still around. Many of you know I did a review of the autobiography of a yogi back in the beginning of the podcast, like episode, I don't know, five or six, something like that. And I love the book, Autobiography of a Yogi. And I love, love, love Paramhansa Yogananda, absolutely. So this book, I would say for me, had a similar impact as Autobiography of a Yogi in a very different way. Paramhansa Yogananda is gonna always be the teacher of my heart, the guru of my heart, who spoke to me in so many ways and has and continues to speak to me and answer so many questions. But I have to say, as a woman on the spiritual path, it's different getting to read the lives of women saints because we do things differently. And Sri Ma is no exception. And in fact, the fact that she was able to attain this great state when she was born into poverty and was working very, very hard, always cleaning and um, the things that women in India are expected to do. Women in India, are, and I would say even women around the world, are usually not afforded a lot of time for their spiritual development. So I, I love this saying, it says, so God meets women while they're working. God comes to women while they're working because they don't have time to go to the temples and go to the mosques and go to the churches every day, the way that many men who have wives at home taking care of them and cooking their food and raising their children are able to do. Many women are also not able to just go up off by themselves in the Himalayas the way that men are able to do. So again, love Paramahansa Yogananda, 
but really fascinated to read the story of a woman who is dealing with stuff that you and I might be dealing with, of course, in her own way. Now, this book is divided into three sections. The first section is Swami Satchinanda telling the story of Srima's life and um, stories of her childhood. She was born in a very, very high state of consciousness and was able to go into that state of consciousness known as Samadhi. And she thought everybody could do that. Everybody could commune with the divine in that way. Um, she was sad to find out that that was not the case. So we read in the first part, her childhood, her development, what it was like for her. Her, her grandmother was really her guru. She considers her grandmother her spiritual teacher. It was her grandmother who taught her how to do puja, how to do the devotional worship that they did in the family. And it was her grandmother that taught her the mantras and all of that, as well as cooking and other things as like that. But she also had a very special connection with um, the amazing Ramakrishna, the saint from India, Ramakrishna, who I'm trying to remember if he was a contemporary of Paramahansa Yogananda. I think he might have come before Paramahansa Yogananda was born, but a very powerful, very powerful saint who was extremely devoted to the Divine Mother. And he married somebody in that lifetime named Sarada Devi. And many people believe that Srima is a reincarnation of Ramakrishna's wife, Sarada Devi. I don't know if she is. I can't say whether she is. It would make sense, though, if she was, but once you read the book and you find out. So the first part is all about Srima's life. The second part is about her connection with Swami Satyananda and how her life changed when she met this uh, Swami who happens to be born in America and then lived and studied in India. And then the third part of the book is um, stories, true life stories from her followers, from some of her devotees. And actually there's a tiny last part of the book I forgot about that are just, um, they're spiritual stories. They're not specific to Sri Ma, but they are stories that have a good spiritual moral in them. And there's, I think these are stories that Swami um, Satyananda likes to share with people. But they're just the, the main parts of the book are the first three. So I'm going to read you a little bit uh, from this book. And I'm going to show you where you can purchase this book. It's not something that you can necessarily find at your local Barnes & Noble, but I do believe you can find it on Amazon. You can also get it directly from Sri Ma's website, which is srima.org. And I will put all this information in the show notes for you so you can see how to get this book, how to find out more about Sri Ma. And let, I'm just going to spell her name for you, S-H-R-E-E. -E, and then Ma is M-A-A. -A. So srima.org is the website. And her organization, if you really want to, if you really want to learn about um, mantras, if you really want to learn about blending East and West, if you really want to learn about how to connect with and worship the divine feminine, it's an incredible resource. There's so many wonderful things on there, so many books. They have MP3s. They have um, webcasts that they do of satsang with her where you can see her giving her talks. Um, she's a beautiful, beautiful musician and singer, and often she's doing kirtan, which is a devotional singing. So that in and of itself is an amazing resource. But I'm going to read just a few things. And the thing that really touched me about Srima, and I'll just share from my experience, is I've spent a lot of time with saints. I've spent a lot of time going on pilgrimage and spending time in places where great saints have lived. And again, unfortunately, we know a lot more about male saints than we do about female saints. And when I use saint, I'm not speaking of any particular spiritual path or religion. Anybody of extremely high consciousness in my mind is a saint. And I've spent time with them. Um, and I can tell you that there's often a lot of, um, what's the word I can use? They're not that accessible. Let me put it that way. So if they're in the West, they're often like, they're usually like, they could be a Catholic monk or a, a Buddhist monk or something like that. And they, they're a little bit more of a, a monastic, meaning that they're kind of separated out from society. They usually don't have families. 
they're usually living more of that monastic life of a, a monk or a nun or something like that. And through that, they reach this highly exalted state. And um, you wouldn't know it, and you probably can't connect with them in their, um, their monastery. And then you have the example of in the East, if you go to the East, if you were to go to India or something like that, a lot of times when a great being is exalted like that, they have their own ashram. Ashram is like a spiritual community. They have their own um, center and they're usually very, you know, involved in all of that. And again, not always easy to have access to them. And a lot of people want to spend time with them. And there's a lot of formality. I guess that's the word I can use. There's a lot of formality around it. And then I read the book about Sri Ma. And she's not like that at all. Like she really, really embodies the energy of a mother, of a divine mother. And I was so struck by the stories of the things that she would do for the people that were her devotees. So people would come and they want to be in her energy. And she does things that a mother would do. First of all, cooks for everybody. She makes sure that everybody that comes to see her, everybody's fed. She actually makes uh, clothes for people. And as she's sewing, see, she's stitching. As so every stitch, there's a mantra so that when you put on the, uh, the shirt that she gives you or you put on the sari that she's made for you, it has this amazing energy because it has her love, her unconditional love sewed with every stitch. She does these things that in my mind are very mundane things, but they're not at all because it's Divine Mother herself doing it. And so of all the people I've met, I really feel like her energy really embodies that energy of mother, or what we think of. Very humble, but very powerful, and just overflowing with the energy of unconditional love. So I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to read a story to you of this. So I have the book in front of me, and this is page 67 for those of you who want to read it along with me. Now, this is a story of when Srima was still in India, because part of the story is that she was in India and she met Swami Satyananda. He was studying in India as well, became a Swami, even though he's from America. And she gets the intuition from her inner guidance from Ramakrishna telling her that she needs to come to the West and that they need to bring the energy of East and West together, the energy of the fatherland and the motherland. They need to bring these together. So she does come, I think in 1984, 1985 to the West, but until then she's in India. And so here's a story about a woman who was a servant, a maid, who loved, loved Sri Ma. She was a devotee of hers but they have the caste system in India. And so she was in the lower caste and didn't feel herself to be worthy of being able to um, really spend time with Sri Ma. So here's the story. There was one servant woman from the lower caste who would bow down to Sri Ma every day before she went to her work of cleaning houses. She was thinking inside herself, Mother is always around rich people. She will never come to my house. I am so poor. I cannot invite Sri Ma to my house. One day, Sri Ma told some devotees, I would like to go to that servant woman's house. And they said, Mother, she is not home. How can we find her home? We know the direction of her home, but not the exact location. Sri Ma said, let's go. We'll find it. So Sri Ma, along with a couple of devotees, went in search of the home, and after numerous inquiries, found the one-bedroom servant's quarters on the fourth floor of a tenement house. When she got into the room, she found a young child about two or three years old, all alone. Sri Ma went into the kitchen, and after cleaning the whole place, prepared food. She cooked a number of dishes, made sure the child ate, offered everything with flowers upon the counter, and then returned to where she was staying and sat down as though nothing had happened. Now you want to remember that 
this say, the servant didn't say anything to Shrima. She was just thinking this, but Shrima picked up on it and she knew, she knew the heart of her devotee. It says the next day, the maidservant came to where mother was staying and told everyone, somebody cleaned my house and prepared food for me. But she was scared. She said, who would do such a thing? Do I have to take my baby to work with me and lock the door of my room? Who would cook for me? Just a lowly servant. One of mother's devotees began laughing and she could not stop. Finally, she told her, it was mother that came to your house and prepared your food. Then the maidservant began to cry. While the maidservant was crying, mother came and hugged her. So you see what I mean <laughs> about this? It's like the manifestation of God that comes to your house, takes care of your child, cleans, cooks your food, feeds your child, leaves flowers there, and takes care of you. I, I was so touched by these stories. It's just so, so sweet. And one after another, there's, there's these beautiful, beautiful stories. The other thing that I really love about Shrima that I really resonate with personally is that she is also, even though she wouldn't use the word interfaith, she's very interfaith, which means simply that she's honoring all the faiths. And so once Swami Satyananda is uh, traveling with her and he's asking her, um, you know, because he's a scholar and he is an amazing, amazing Swami in and of himself. And he's very humble, but he can speak many, many languages. And he has been able to translate uh, scripture just into different languages. Just really, really amazing. So, but he's asking her because he's a scholar. He wants to know, Mataji. There are so many various schools of philosophy. To which school do you belong? And to which branch of philosophy should your devotees owe allegiance? So this is on page 101 of the book. So he's asking her. You know, they always want to do things correctly and do it the right way. And Srima looked, looked at him with great joy in her eyes and said, what schools of philosophy are you referring to? He says, I immediately answered her, confident in all the studies I had performed. Mother, in Sanskrit literature, there are seven classical schools of philosophy. Each of them advocates a different position. And then he goes through all seven of them, which I'm not going to go into now, but it's basically Charvaka and Nyaya and Yoga is its own. And... Um, Purva and Tantra and all these different ones. So he, after he goes all of, through all of them, he says, Shrima, to which school of philosophy do you belong? And which philosophy is appropriate for your followers? Shrima, who was listening very intently, withdrew inside and sat very still for a long time. After some time, a beautiful smile of recognition came across her face. Slowly, she moved her tongue around her mouth, moistening her lips, and opened her eyes, which were radiant with compassion. Then she gave her answer. The philosophies which you have described are not really different schools of philosophy. Actually, the Sanskrit term is shaka, branches. They are all branches of one philosophy, and taken together, they are the one path to self-realization. Every child in its infant state knows only what the senses tell it. A child seeks the warmth of its mother and cries for food instinctively, not because of a logical de deduction. As we evolve, we begin to judge, and we learn how to discriminate using our mental faculties as a test of propriety. Sometimes we seek to dis discriminate between our changing nature and our changeless reality. Again, we seek to unite the two. Through devotion to our worship, we arrive at the realization of Vedanta, the unity of oneness. Mankind is constantly moving between the various forms of worship and the various schools of philosophy. Regardless of whether you call yourself a devotee or an intellectual, regardless of whether you perform with understanding or without, each of us in our every action is acting in accordance with one philosophy or another. Therefore, we all belong to all the schools of philosophy as they are elements of the one path of unity. I love, love, love that. Because it's so true. You know, people wonder about why we have different, different religions and different spiritual paths. 
as well as everybody's in a different place. So what might be appropriate to you when you're at one stage of your life wouldn't necessarily fit. And I think people can really get themselves stuck when they try to, you know, adhere to one thing as if it's the only way when really we're meant to be evolving. We're meant to be evolving and going deeper into our understanding. So no matter which philosophy and which religion you belong to, she says, it's all the same. I love that. And the last thing I will share with you of these beautiful, um, this beautiful book is from the back where people were telling about Shrima and the stories with them. And there's a woman telling her story of how she wanted to live here in the United States at Ma's ashram. I believe it's in Napa, Napa, California now. And so I am now on page 182. And this is something that is on a poster of Sri Ma. And it really sums up her message and her philosophy. So I'm going to read it to you. Sri Ma's message. Be true. Say what you mean and do what you say. If you are true, you will be without fault. If your conscience is clear, your heart will be silent. That is peace, no matter what the result. Be simple. Many words are a burden to the soul. The real message of your heart will be communicated by your actions. The words will only explain the actions, but they must agree lest we become hypocrites who preach what we ourselves do not practice. Be free. Leave your selfishness behind. The people whose opinions are valued will love us for what we are, not for what we have. The respect which can be bought is as useless as a tree which bears neither flowers nor fruits. When the leaves will fall and the trunk wither, none will come again. Take refuge in God. Neither your friends, relations, or others will take you to heaven. Only in wisdom will be our salvation. Cultivate wisdom. Learn from everyone, everywhere. Then use that knowledge which will bring you into harmony with the universe. Develop discrimination. Pursue only those desires which will make you free. Leave the ones which will get you into trouble. Know the difference and remind yourselves daily. Remember that the God you seek resides in every atom. You can offer respect to every atom, even while you maintain your own discipline inside. That you are a spiritual seeker is not something that you need to show outside. It will manifest in your behavior without your having to try. If we are gentle, loving, kind, and honest in our dealings, that is spiritual. Your spirituality cannot be hidden. Similarly, if one is full of fears and trying to hide his inner emotions, such a person is not full of spirit. That is only an ego. Let all our actions manifest our love. Work is visible love, the expression of love that we can see. People want realization, liberation, to become enlightened. Do not think it is something different from doing for others as you would have them do for you. Spirituality is very simple. I am everywhere, says the sage. I exist in every form of creation. If I hurt any form, I hurt myself. If I raise any form to a higher level, I myself find progress. It is easy. So my friends, I highly recommend if you want something to really lift you up in this month of miracles, if you really want to tune into the, the vibration of Divine Mother, if you want to know that there is a manifestation of Divine Mother walking around on the planet right now. Again, I will put the information in the show notes where you can find out more about her. You can also see her beautiful videos on YouTube, and I'll put a link in there to one of my favorite videos of her singing this beautiful Divine Love song. It moves me to tears every time I listen to it. It's so incredible. I highly recommend, my friends, that you read this book, Sri Ma, The Life of a Saint by Swami Satyananda Saraswati. Thank you so much, my miraculous friend. 
And please always, always keep in mind that the key to magnifying your miracles is to remember that your miracle is already here. God bless you. Bye-bye.